Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 22nd annual Adelphi Athletics Black History Month celebration. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. My name is Kevin Dexter. I'm excited to be your host for this evening. Uh, before we get started, uh, the first event here was held in uh, 2003. First time we held this event at Adelphi. Again, 22nd year in a row uh, to be holding a Black History Month celebration. It was created by former director of athletic media relations, Suzette McQueen, who is now the deputy athletics director and senior woman administrator at Kent State. Uh, before we start, I want to give a quick shout out and a thank you to the athletic department, the Office of Alumni Relations, and Adelphi's multicultural chapter for their continued support. And thank you to the Adelphi Student Athlete Advisory Committee and the Subcommittee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, led by junior track and field athlete Bryce Ridley. Bryce sent along some great questions, uh, which we will have as part of our conversation here. But without further ado, let's welcome in our special guest tonight. He is the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for BSC Global, Jackie Wilson. We have the pleasure to be joined by tonight. Hey, good Jackie, evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. We appreciate hey, it. Hey, thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Uh, how's your All-Star break been so far? Were you just uh, at All-Star Weekend in Indy? Yes, it was an it was an all star break for for others. It was a, it was an all star working uh, weekend uh, for for the rest of us. I always say that the all star game is is kind of like a college spring break uh, multiplied by a thousand. What is that experience like? Before we get into it, must be uh, must be fun, but also hectic. It's it's fun, but it's really where the business of sport uh, really really get a chance to intersect. A lot of people think about you know, what happens on the court, but a lot of the business, you know, takes place during All-Star Weekend. You're meeting with with sponsors, you're trying to work different deals, you're having conversations with with different teams. So it's, it's a lot of fun, uh, but it's it's a full speed act activity. Uh, so again, you're the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for BSC Global, of course, working closely with the Brooklyn Nets and, and all the properties at BSC. Uh, tell us a little bit, what does your job entail on a day-to-day -day basis, week-by-week -week basis? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that. I think a lot of people hear the term DEI and aren't really sure, you know, what that means because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different organizations. Um, for me, I spend about 30% of my time on the internal side of things. So that's everything from reviewing hiring slates to working on uh, retention promotion opportunities, as well as overseeing our employee uh, resource groups. Externally, a lot of my work uh, focuses on access programming. And so it's, it's really programming that provides access to opportunity to underserved and marginalized communities. So think um, the supplier diversity program, any of our HBCU initiatives. I work on our criminal justice reform initiatives as well. And then the third bucket is what we call the United Games, which is anything that you see one of our teams. And so taking a step back with BSC Global where the Brooklyn Nets, we're the New York Liberty, we're the Long Island Nets, we're, we're Nets GC, and, and we're Barclays Center. So anything that you're going to see that touches on culture or heritage from any of those properties, from celebrating Black History Month on the court to having an AAPI market, um, you know, during, during May out on our plaza, anything that touches on culture and heritage, my department has a hand in. You've made a, a lot of different stops throughout your career before you got to this point, and we're going to go through them tonight, uh, hear about your journey. Was working in sports always a goal for you, you know, when you were a, a college student and, and you were growing up? Absolutely. And this is going to, to age me a little bit. Um, but when I was a, a kid, there was an HBO show called Arliss, and Arliss was a super agent. And so on, on the show, he represented Bo Jackson and Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky. And so at a very early age, I said, I want to get into sports. I want to be, I want to be around this. But I didn't actually know um, what that what that meant. And so I knew that I wanted to be in sports, but the job, you know, for example, that I have now didn't exist when I was watching Arliss on HBO many years ago. Were you an athlete growing up? I was. I was. I'm I'm a recovering athlete. Um, I played uh tennis, basketball, and football growing up uh, with, with tennis being my, my best sport. Basketball, my favorite. Tennis, my best sport. So, you know, what were your 
kind of career goals, right? You, you decided you had this passion for sports, right? Maybe realize, which I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of people uh, who are watching this, you know, a lot of people who work in sports, you realize, hey, I'm not going to be a professional player, right? So, mm -hmm. so I want to get into this in some other capacity. You know, what were your goals uh, starting out on, on how you could get into, uh, into a life working in sports? I mean, my goal initially was to meet as, as many people as, as possible. To your point, me and every person I knew growing up dreamed of being a professional athlete, but not a lot of us thought about working in the business of sports simply because we weren't exposed. We didn't know that these opportunities um, existed. So I knew that I wanted to be in sports and all I knew was either be a player or be an agent. And so going back to Arliss, Arliss was an agent. And so when I went to school, I went to school um, with the goal of being an agent, but completely blind to any of the opportunities that, that may have existed out, outside of that. So um, I had a vague idea of the industry, but I had no idea where I actually wanted to, to end up because I just wasn't exposed to enough yet. Right. So you went, uh, you attended two really prestigious schools, right? You, you did your undergrad at Duke. You went to law school then at Notre Dame. Uh, one by one, I guess we'll start with with Duke, right? What was your college experience like? What was it like, um, you know, doing your undergrad at, at such a big, um, and obviously for sports and just academically as well, uh, university? I absolutely loved Duke. Um, I grew up being a fan of Grant Hill. I I wanted to to be Grant Hill on on the basketball court, and so when they won those championships in '91 and in '92, I was at the age to. To where it was like, hey, I can I can pick a team and and start rooting and following. So I was a diehard fan from from that um, that standpoint. I knew Duke was the only school I wanted to go to. It was the only school I applied to. Um, so Duke is is where I wanted to be for undergrad. Um, and while I had tremendous experiences there, made great relationships there, you know, it's interesting that some of my time at Duke kind of led me to some of the work that that we do here. Um, because I was one of the few people on the undergraduate judicial committee um, at Duke University. And so we started looking into different policies to make sure that, you know, when you were being judged by a panel of your student peers, then they were actually your, your student peers. And so it was that type of thinking and process. We weren't calling it DEI back then. We were just calling it the right thing to do. Right. Um, but it's, you know, interesting that, that that journey started, you know, along those lines there. Uh, do you have you know memories of attending any basketball games as a student? A lot of them, <laughs> like a, a a lot of them. I'm, one of my one of my close friends, uh, you know, at, lived in my dorm. Chris Duhan was on was on the team, so I was, you know, keen to go to go be there um, and be around. But but truthfully, everybody at at Duke, like it, you, you kind of go there, and, and similarly to going going to Notre Dame, like if you're not into to Duke basketball and or, or Notre Dame football then there's a lot of other choices that you could probably probably make. But if you're going, you're going to Duke, you're going to the gangs. So you said, of course, that, you know, the goal was always to be an agent. So did you have your eye on law school, even when you were at Duke? Um, the, you know, I, did, I did. Um, I did. But, it, but again, I didn't have, I didn't have the goal of going straight out into, to being an agent. I knew that I wanted to go to law school so that I could learn how to negotiate contracts. Um, but while I was in undergrad, a couple of my advisors told me that the best course of action coming out of law school is to spend a couple of years learning how to be an attorney before going to, you know, use those skills in a profession that where that's not the, the primary muscle that you're flexing all of the time. So I knew I wanted to go to law school. I knew law school was a path for me, hopefully to, to get into sports, but I was not thinking that that sports would be the next step directly coming out of coming out of school. Uh, so, what was that you know law school experience like? Was it um, you know different from from Notre Dame to Duke? Um, what kind of experiences uh, you know you just spoke about the experiences you had at Duke, right? That have helped you today. Mm -hmm. What kind of experiences uh, did Notre Dame provide? You know that have helped you in your career. You know, I, I always say going to law school was one of the best decisions um, that I made. Uh, while I, I, you know, I say that I'm a recovering attorney now, I don't, I don't practice on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. The skill base that I developed um, in law school is something that I rely upon, you know, every every single day. So I, I think that that was one of the 
best choices that I've made. And it taught me, you know, I would say my critical thinking and writing skills um, jumped significantly from, from being in law school. And those are, are two of the skills that, that I get an opportunity to, to use in my day-to-day -day life now. But I heavily recommend anyone on this call who is, is thinking about going into law school, whether or not you end up wanting to practice forever at, at the end or not, um, the way that law school teaches you to think and, and then problem solve, I, I think is critical. So after law school, you you had fulfilled that dream, right? To become an mm -hmm. agent um, for a short time, as you just talked about. You know, what was your experience like looking back on it, uh, being a sports agent, you know, kind of living out that dream? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, <laughs> so I, I will tell you that I absolutely love negotiating contracts. I love recruiting talent. I, I love going and, you know, helping someone's dreams be become reality. The thing that I did not like about being a sports agent was um, the recruiting. I I lived on on an airplane, and so you know that means that you know anniversaries and birthdays and Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's and like all of those things were like I, I was always the hey I I hope I can pop by, but but you know not really able able to do that. But it's awesome. And that the upside is totally up to you. It's an eat what you kill business. And so if you want to compare working on the agent side versus working on the team side, there's no limit to how many contracts Rich Paul can go out there, you know, and, and negotiate. Um, but, you know, there, there is a limit to, you know, what your, your contract or commission base will be, you know, on, on the team side. But the floor is also a, a lot lower too, because again, it's a it's an eat what you kill business. So if you're not if you're not killing, um, then that's a tough tough role to to go. You know, the agent business is something I'm sure you know everybody out here on this call is a sports fan in some capacity, right? Which we as the average sports fan don't always get exposed to, right? So you know, what what is one experience that you had that maybe the average sports fan wouldn't know, you know, about being an agent? Um, that would be interesting. I would say that, you know, and again, not, not to age, not to age myself, but, you know, the athletes now have developed their brands at a significantly earlier age than athletes uh, when I, when I was an agent. And so I think that that has led to a different exposure and a different understanding. I think that athletes today um, have a little bit more understanding of the game than athletes uh, when, when I came in. But it always surprised me with how interacting with these athletes that you're seeing on TV that are, you know, competing at the highest level. When they sit down, you know, at the business meeting, it's one of those like, you know, kings and queens put their pants on one leg at a time, you know, type type of situation. And so I remember the the first time you know that I that I was in a meeting. One of the one of the clients that that we represented was was Jerome Bettis, and he was a, a Notre Dame guy. And I was so excited to to meet him with my Notre Dame shirt on. I'm I'm, I'm new to the agency, and came out to reach my hand, and he gave me this big hug and said, "Boy, sit down." I was like, "Oh, you you just like me." Um, and so like that was that was a cool experience, and I actually think that those type of experiences have helped me you know, throughout my career, both as a, as an agent and now on, on the other side, because, you know, I, I view, you know, athletes as, as people just like us. Did you ever get starstruck? Um, I'm starstruck all the time. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, you know, you know, boy band, you know, crushing type thing, but like, I have pinched myself moments. I, I would say, I don't know, once a week, you know, at, at least like I am so blessed and fortunate to be in a position to where I get to share space, you know, with, with some of the, the cream of the crop. And I never take that, you know, for, for granted. I have courtside access to, to games and, and can get around. But, you know, when I tell you that I was, you know, 
geeking out and sending text messages to my wife at the all-star game and things of that nature. Like, yeah, I still, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't impact how I do my job, but right. yeah. Uh, one more question on, on the agent experience, you know, to the same point, you, you spoke a little bit about the difficulties of it before. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, and I'm sure people watching, you know, are curious, you know, are there any, you know, stories that you can share, right? Just kind of the dark side, maybe of, of being an agent and the agency life that, um, you know, that, that makes the job so difficult as, as you were touching on before. Yeah. And like, I don't even know that this is the, the dark side. But but this is this is just the nature of the game, and and I'll use the phrase again. It's it's an eat what you kill type of type of business, and so you spend, you know, you gotta have you have to have money to make money. So there's resources that you spend to go out and recruit. You're buying flights and hotels and spending time or, away from your family and investing in the players in which you're recruiting. And at the end of the day, they either sign with you or you don't. Like right. there is, there is no partial credit. You don't get to go back to your boss and say like, I got, I need a, a B plus for this. <laughs> like you either got the deal done or you didn't. And that money at, at that point is just gone. So it's an investment that they're making. Um, so that's disappointing. So there's been a couple of times where I thought that there was going to be, you know, a uh, light at the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and, and we got, we got to the tunnel um, and, and it didn't work out like that's, that's defeating. Uh, but when it does work out, it is pretty dope. So what, you know, what was the process for you in deciding you didn't want to be an agent anymore um, and, you know, move into uh, to a different you know type of the field? I, it was a lifestyle adjustment. Um, again, I loved the business of negotiating deals, um, but I was not someone who, who needed to be on the road um, and out as much as as much as I as much as I was, and so I wanted to to have something to where I was a little. My schedule was a little bit more predictable. My schedule's still not very predictable, but at least there's some seasonality um, to it and, and some parameters. Like the the Nets and and the Liberty and Long Island Nets will have a schedule, so like I, I I do know when those when those games are. Um, so after you left the agency side, uh, you went to the right fit, right? That's a firm mm -hmm. responsible for managing luxury health and fitness centers. So what mm -hmm. was that transition like? What was your experience there? Like, um, you know, how were you able to kind of transition your career? Yeah. So, you know, one of the, the cool stories from, from agent life is that I've, you know, used to work with our athletes on the, the training side of, of things too. Uh, we were not we got to a point to where we weren't pleased with uh, the training regimen of, of some of the athletes. And, you know, you make the money that you make is 100% contingent upon their ability uh, to make money. And so I started getting involved and in training our athletes um, so that they were, you know, in shape and, and ready to go for the combines and, and for, for different workouts. And so as I look to transition from, you know, being on the sports side, I had started building up the, the connections and and uh and the know-how to be able to to pivot over um to working on on the fitness side and so you know working you know with with this firm and and others gave me the opportunity uh to continue to work with uh work with athletes just not in the the representation uh capacity from there then you started your own company in fitness right yep. is, is that where it kind of started the, the gears All, started turning for you all, all of that, all of that came came together, like right, right around, right around the same time. And then, you know, that the business opportunity was, you know, infusing technology um, into your fitness workout. And so it was type of work that we were that we were already doing with athletes and now able to uh, put it into a wearable uh, technology and, and merge merge those worlds. And what was the entrepreneurship, you know, kind of experience like for you starting your own company? Um, I would, you know, being an agent is is extremely, you know, on, entrepreneurial. It's it is not your, you know, traditional nine nine to five to five job. You have your own budget that you are that you are managing. You're responsible for your own expenses and people that may that may work for you. So I got the entrepreneurial bug during the during the agency life. Um, but then the opportunity to go out and, and run, you know, my own, you know, couple of brick and mortar locations uh, was definitely awesome. 
uh, but but you're out there swimming swim with our, our life raft. Uh, but it was but it was great. I absolutely, absolutely enjoyed it. Um, but I have scratched that entrepreneurial bug uh, at, at this point. <laughs> uh, what did you learn the most from that process? How to maximize every available resource. Um, and so, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, you know, particularly if you're not coming out with a, you know, multi-million dollar capital raise coming out, you have to be extremely frugal and strategic about where every single, where every single dollar goes. And so I found so many different ways to get my desired outcome, whether or not that was a vendor or whatever, access to something without spending money. And so it was how, how do you resourceful to make it so that when I did have to spend money, like I actually needed to, to spend money. Uh, was that, and from you know my research, that was probably right around the time that the pandemic started, you were mm -hmm. doing this. How did that kind of affect uh, you know, the, uh, the business aspect of it? Well, I mean, the the governor shut every shut every brick and mortar lo location down, yeah. um, and you know we we shifted to a a virtual model, and you know the the fitness company continued to go, but I was at a crossroads with, you know, it gave me an opportunity to figure out where it was that I wanted to take take the next step in my journey, and it was during that time of of reflection that uh, George Floyd was murdered. And I watched sports lead an international conversation that I didn't think enough voices were present in the room for. And so I felt an obligation to get back into to sports on that level. So taking a step back with the agency, one of my primary responsibilities was overseeing the community projects that the agent that the players did, as well as any of their social social justice or social responsibility work that they wanted to do within the community. And so I was establishing foundations for players that were creating these access programs that I'm now doing on the, the BSC side of things. And so I was watching and saying like, there is an opportunity and I feel like my voice is missing. And at that same time, uh, Joe and Clara Sai came out with a five point action plan uh, that established a fifty million dollars social justice fund, and you know created a lot of the role and responsibilities that are that I'm in now. So it was um, right place, right time, um, and desire um, obligation actually to to get back and and make sure that my voice was heard. It seems like it was like you just kind of said perfect timing in terms of what your you know personal goals you you, you said your personal uh, obligation that you felt and that this role uh, you know came up kind of at a perfect time for you. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so what um, what are some initiatives? You know, we talked about it a little bit earlier. You know, that's been I guess almost four years in this role mm -hmm. for you. Um, you know, from from taking this opportunity. And obviously, running with it, what what are some of the initiatives you started um, in this uh, department at BSC? Um, I'd say one of the one of the initiatives that I'm I'm most proud of is our supplier diversity program. And so we have just entered um, year three of this program. This program was one of the action points in in the five point action plan that that I just mentioned, which was making sure that we were great neighbors and establishing diversity within the suppliers and vendors that we used. And so Brooklyn is the most diverse area in the world. And so we wanted to make sure that we were diversifying within our vendor process. And so since that time frame, we've you know onboarded over 400 um, minority women-owned vendors uh, within Brooklyn that we actively work with, that we actively create opportunities through our relationships with different partners for and now we're in step two of that program to where we've now brought them into Barclays Center into an area that we call the Brooklyn Market. And the Brooklyn Market is a smorgasbord, a rotating smorgasbord of uh, five different vendors, all local MW and, and MWBE vendors. They come in, they get the opportunity to 
uh, give their food and beverage offerings out to 17,000 fans for six weeks. If they do a great job, we have the opportunity to bring them back for, for another six weeks. And if they knock it out the park, we can give them a full-time stand. And so that barrier to entry is, is now re removed for a lot of local vendors who don't know if they can come in if we're, without that proof of concept for a full-time stand. And so this is this area of opportunity because on your worst case scenario, you've had six weeks in there and now 17,000 fans over six weeks have had the opportunity to interact with you, know about you and can drive awareness back to your brick and mortar location. So you, you're just speaking on that, right? In terms of the food and beverage options, right? In Barclay Center, obviously the, the theme nights you talked about before, right? In terms mm -hmm. of honoring different types of cultures. Um, what are some of the things that, you know, the fans don't necessarily see right there at Barclay Center when they walk in, right? But other initiatives that you, you guys work on within your department? Um, what do you mean? Because in, in my in my mind, I, I want them to, to see it all. Um, DEI, and that's why I started by saying it means so many different things to, to different places. DEI is in, is in everything you know, that, that we do. It's in the hiring of, of the people that, that you're, you're interacting in. I mean, when you walk into to the arena, it is our various merchandise collaborations that, that are in there that you may know about or you may not. It just looks like cool designs, but they're merchandise collaborations with you know, local, local vendors and, and local designers. There's food outside of the Brooklyn market to where we've brought in local vendors within our Amex and different in different places. And so in, in my mind, I want you to be able to, to touch and feel and experience everything that we do from our plaza you know, activations that have nothing to do you know, with the games from AAPI night to Angela Yee day to the layout. All of those things are meant to be a communal gathering space. And so if you think about George, George Floyd gets murdered and now we're in the summer of 2020, Barclay Center Plaza became a natural gathering center. And so we now look at that as a place where we want people to, com to continue to, to convene. And so that's why there's these activations for people to come there. And if you're standing on the Atlantic Terminal, there's a big sign that says, you belong here. And on the other sign, it, it, it says, we belong here. And so all of those are initiatives that are, that are meant for every resident of Brooklyn to see themselves when they walk into Barclay Center and see themselves in the programming that that we have. You touched on it a bit earlier, Brooklyn, you mean New York as a whole, but specifically mm -hmm. Brooklyn, right? Being so diverse um, as a borough, does that make, um, you know, it, it's important anywhere in the country, but does that make it even more important uh, from your perspective for the Nets and for this organization to be as in touch with the community, you know, because of the, the different um, you know, people and, and faces that are going to be coming into the building on, on a nightly basis? 1000%. Because to your point, to, your, to the last thing that you just said, there's no guarantee that those many different faces will continue or ever will come in, we're coming to that building. When people talk about DEI, there's not enough conversation around the, the business, you know, argument, you know, behind this. If we are operating in one of the most diverse places in the world, we need to be able to understand all of those different perspectives because we are trying to sell to absolutely everyone. If we are not diverse, if we are singular in our thinking, we're only going to appeal to one or two different demographics and we want everybody to come. Right. So, so absolutely. How does that represent the NBA as a whole? I mean, the NBA is uh, as you, know, you just think about the players on the court, right? So many different places in the world now, right? Players are coming from, um, you know, different markets. Uh, so into basketball, basketball has become such a global sport. You know, how much uh, does basketball, I guess, kind of represent, you know, what you guys are looking to, to do as a whole, um, just because of the diversity of the sport on the court? Um, I like to think that we're ahead of basketball. I like to think that they're looking at us to, mm -hmm. to, to help. And so I, I look at us as all of us are pushing toward, towards the same goal. And I think that iron sharpens iron. So as one group with, within our, you know, family, 
you know, pushes, it's going to push you to push harder, push harder as well. But I don't, I don't necessarily think that there is a pressure from, you know, the NBA for us to be doing what we're doing. We just agree. Um, and, and, and it's one of those things where we, we'd be doing it if the NBA was not doing it. How do you see, you touched on, you know, when you were coming out of school, right, that a job like this um, and a department like this didn't exist, right? And your journey, how have you seen, not just the NBA, but at sports in general grow over those, you know, that 20 year or so time period into being more inclusive, right? And and being um, more, um, you know, all, allowing more of those faces from all over the world uh, to be able to come and, and enjoy sports as a whole. I mean, it's been, it's been interesting to to see. I think that you know, obviously some some sports have, you know, em, embraced it more than than others or and have been quicker to to move. Um, but it's it is not surprising because again, it is not it is less the the conversation about the right thing to do. The right thing to do is is not a sustainable, you know, conversation. It is again a business imperative. You need to be able to attract so many different people because you're all fighting for for audience share everybody's fighting for for screens and and eyeballs and so you want to be able to you know you're you're selling yourself short if you're not able to market appeal and understand all of the various dem demographics and so it it does not surprise me that that it's happening it's noticeable and i appreciate it um but it, it doesn't surprise me I do want to take a second. I know a lot of people, uh, I'm sure, have enjoyed the conversation so far. If you guys have any questions, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, feel free to put any questions in. We're going to do a few more to get to, but we are happy uh, while Jackie's here to get to as many questions from anybody out there that is watching um, as we possibly can. We do, as I mentioned off the top, have a lot of questions from uh, the SAC DEI subcommittee here at Adelphi, led by Bryce Ridley, uh, junior track and field student athlete. Great job um, by them to, to share a bunch of questions for you, Jackie. Um, so, you know, I'll I'll go through that as, and again, if anybody has any to drop in the Q&A box, uh, now would be a great time for that. Um, so first one from them, and we'll go through all these, is how do you, you know, obviously a, a large majority of the group on this call uh, are student athletes. So, you know, how do you collaborate with student athletes uh, to promote, you know, the DEI in uh, in the sports community. So, did, you know, when I when I saw that that question on there, I was like, this is this is an area of of opportunity. I would I would say that we um, have not done a lot of collaborating with collegiate student athletes on on these on these initiatives. We do a lot of collaboration, you know, at the at the youth and high school level. Um, and at the youth and high school level, a lot of that collaboration is working with um, pr primarily basketball players, boys and girls, basketball players, and then providing them what opportunities outside of basketball. So whether or not that is, you know, doing arena tours of, of Barclays Center or having the opportunity to have roundtable discussions with people from different departments within our organization that look like them or had have had shared experiences or offering, you know, shadow opportunities and in, in some instances for for young athletes. Just again, because so many people know about the opportunities that exist within the field of play, but not many people have been exposed to the business side of things. And so the way that we look to collaborate is to provide access to opportunity um, for those athletes. But we have not done as much on the on the collegiate side. Uh, they also ask, how do you address challenges, resistance uh, when promoting these DEI initiatives? Um, it's difficult, but it it is easier to figure out a place where there's commonality. And so again, if using using the the business, you know, case for it. If one person has a, a certain view um, as it relates to to DEI, and the other person has a has a different view, if person A is able to show how their view has a positive impact 
on person B, that generally changes the conversation. If I can talk to you about how hiring more people from this area or more people who have this type of skill set will help you make more money, that's a different conversation that now opens your eyes and then it becomes, a, oh, this is how this is beneficial for me. And so again, I always try to take a step back from the right thing to do and have the conversation as to how this is necessary for all of us to collectively win. Again, if anybody has any questions, um, drop them in that Q and A box on the bottom, and we'll get to them here, uh, you know, as soon as we can. Yep. Um, I will. I will tell you, it is so difficult answering these questions and only seeing you. I can't tell if I'm getting the head nod. I can't tell <laughs> <the> people. <laughs> I'm sure we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of positive reviews, but yes, any comment? I'll be telling myself. <laughs> even if there's not you know, questions and and comments, you know, I, again, drop them in there, and, and we'll pass them along. Um, so also, you know, Bryce and the subcommittee um, asking, you know, this is the way they worded the question about student athletes, but, you know, I'm curious just in general mm -hmm. um, about, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, how you guys go, you know, about supporting, you know, advocating, um, which I, you've spoken about a little bit already, but just the underrepresented, you know, community in terms of, you know, er everything that you guys touch um, at BSC. Yeah, so we have um, essential to us are our employees. And so, we listen to to our employees, whether or not that is, you know, the, the people that that work in in marketing, DEI, HR, or are the people that that work on the court, and you know, a lot of that is done through our employee resource groups. Um, I think some schools call them, you know, affinity groups, but we have seven um, with, within our organization that meet on a on a monthly basis, and they push the organization if there are issues that are are impacting one one community you know more disparagingly than than other communities like they they raise their hands if there are policies and things that the organization can do that would help a collective group of people move forward they they raise their hand when we talked about kevin you call them theme nights we call them united games because i don't like to use the word themes uh for mm -hmm. for for those games but when we're talking about those games for the Black History Month games, I'm tapping into our Black Alliance network and I'm asking them, hey, how do you want to show up? Hey, this is the celebration that, that we're looking for. Do you want to be more educational or do you want to be more cele celebratory you know, with, within this? And so that is our, our checks, and, checks and balances. And you know, so many of us you know, li live, in live in Brooklyn, like we're around here. My kids are, are in the schools. You know, yes. over 90% of the people that work in the arena, you know, are Brooklyn, Brooklyn residents. And so we are, we are listening to our employees and, and, and tapping in. For the student athletes out there who want to get more involved in DEI efforts, whether that's at Adelphi, in their own communities, you know, what advice do you have for them on getting involved and making a difference? I think that I think there's two different ways. I think that there's one, there's there's you want to get involved for a particular cause. Again, DEI is so broad. So you care about X. Whatever, whatever X is, there's there's an affinity group and professional organization that I promise you is working in, in that space and is dying for student participation. And so if you were talking about access programming, for example. In, in the black community, like the, the Urban League would love for you to give them a call and, and get, in, get involved in that. If you were talking about, you know, different initiatives that are keeping, you know, women in sports, whether that is female participation at the youth level and working with a group like Power Play, or that is, you know, advocating for more increased representation of women in the sports industry in general. All of that starts at college. That's working with a group like women's women in sports and, and entertainment. And so there's all different types of groups that are looking to to push whatever it is that that you're looking for. Um, but I would say to identify what it is that your passion point is and then start getting exposure within those groups. Um how do you measure the effectiveness of these initiatives? Do you have any metrics that you use to, to track your progress? 
Um, we we track hiring, promotions, and and retention on on internal, on the the external programming. We we track number of programs, no, number of people that that participated for programs that we've done year over year. How was that participation grown? So if you take our HBCU uh, fair four years ago, it was a panel or a fair that that took place over over Zoom and then went to a thousand high school students to fifteen hundred high school students to twenty five hundred high school students over the the last time frame or more people buying tickets to our United Games and so looking at activations from AAPI night last year versus AAPI night this year and are we adding programming um, within that and so for us it is really our, our statistics are really about about engagement because at the end of the day for us it is all about again being good neighbors but but really gen, gen, like growing and developing generational fandom so the more engagement that we have and touch points with the community the better uh, we have two questions just submitted from Jessica here. Well, first off, um, she asks, have any of the athletes that you work with ever brought up any ideas for initiatives? Yes. And so our athletes are are actively involved. And, and so each year we, we meet with basketball operations, we meet with the players and uh, my team, along with, you know, the community team and a couple of other teams go through and outline all of the different initiatives that we are looking to be a, to be in for the next year. And at the same time, we're asking them, what types of initiatives are you looking for? Because for some of those, we go out and build those initiatives for them. And so if you look at Ben Simmons, Ben Simmons, you know, was looking to work in the intersection of sports and social justice. And so we help build out a program with Ben, an organization called Rise and a community group called called Good Shepherd. And so that's an example of us working with the athletes because we can build any of the programs that the athletes are, are looking to touch. But athletes coming to us and saying that this is the way that I wanna have an impact in, in my community is a, one of my favorite things to hear. Uh, Jessica also asks about work that you and your counterparts, maybe with other teams, organizations do in conjunction with the NBA Social Justice Coalition. Um. I would say that some of my counterparts are a bit more active in the social justice coalition than I am strictly as a function of how our business is, is structured. So our social justice fund is run separately from, from BSE. So our social justice initiative, so if you, if you ever see uh, the social justice fund with Joe and, and Clara Sai, like that is separate for us. And so that $50 million social justice fund is outside of that. Specifically for us, we work with um, the Social Justice Coalition on identifying different community leaders, different businesses, and different areas of opportunity in which the coalition can come in to support. And so if the coalition has $100,000 of grant money to go around to different businesses within New York, we're going to work with the coalition to help source who those businesses uh, would be. But in terms of determining the social justices initiatives and their focus, that is less of, of, of what we do. Uh, back to some questions from the student athletes already submitted. Um, can you discuss a time when you've had to navigate you know, something that's been particularly challenging, uh, a DEI issue within the industry, whether that's you know, in this job or maybe um, in your past part of your career? Um, yeah, I think. I think all of us can. Y'all, y'all watch the news. Y'all see, y'all see what, uh, what, what, what is, what goes through. I will say the the most challenging part about my job is that there is someone that is always upset. Like sometimes it's a little bit upset. Sometimes it's a little little bit mad. Sometimes it's all the way upset because there's a leaning in on one issue versus versus the other. There are very few uh, political issues or social justice issues to where people are lukewarm um, within that. And so navigating the different opinions of my colleagues and having to be able to, to hold space and empathize with everyone 
while at the same time recognizing that we are in a for-profit business and the goal is to work. So we need everybody to be able to work together. Um, those are the times that are are the most difficult um, to navigate. It's not it's not about coming out with a with a statement or things of that nature. It is making sure that colleagues um, and the community still look at each other as teammates, despite the fact that they may have a disagreement on something that's going out outside of our four walls. Again, before we wrap this up, if anybody has any questions, uh, throw them in that uh, Q and A box. And just one popped in here. Um, so one from Ashley here, um, who asks: Since switching your profession, are there any moments outside of you know meeting athletes that you can't recreate in your current role? Does meeting entertainers count because <laughs> she said athletes <laughs> I like that that to me is is the stuff that that you you can't you can't recreate like you can't I can do absolutely all of these things again outside of this role I can go to all-star I can I can be a, I can go to the NBA draft um but having the opportunity to actually influence what is happening during those events is the thing that you can't you can't recreate. You can't like you may go ahead and, and meet an athlete somewhere else, but an athlete having a conversation with you about the impact that they're looking to have and you being able to help shape what that is is the thing that you you just can't recreate. And then you get to go home and you see it happen, you see it on Instagram or a video pops up and you get to share that with with your family like i can buy tickets to all the games for the rest of my life but i can't recreate that moment a couple more uh jessica submitting here uh any suggestions for how an athletic department can get their foot in the door you know start to establish these partnerships uh in the community in the dei space i would say that and I don't. I assume that that Adelphi is is do is doing this, but I, to me, it is it is mixing athletics with access programming, and so it is finding different community programs that also are putting the athletes in a in a better spot. It's if I want to go out and you know help a community coding program, like I'm also learning how to how to code within that, and I'm picking up skills that are outside of my of my skill in my you know field of field of play and so it's it is make it is just again choosing choosing organ choosing community partners and i promise you that the school will back you if you say like hey we as a collective want to work with this community organization that is having this impact that is creating pathways and that's all that that is it's the creation of, of the pathways. That's how you get more diverse is, is allowing more people to have seats at the table. Uh, Jessica also asks, what's the most unique foundation that you've helped an athlete establish? Um, let's go with Jerome. So Jerome's um, foundation uh, in Detroit, the Jerome Bettis Foundation was, was established to I uh, bridged the digital div divide that was taking place in, in Detroit. Inner city students didn't have access to computers, didn't have access to Wi-Fi. And so Jerome established a, a foundation that allowed for, for those students to be able to, to have that, that access. And he was able to give that to thousands of students um, with, within Detroit at a time when people were, were not thinking about the impact of not having a computer, you know, would would be. This was a time where we went from, and the students on this call don't know this time, but there was a time where you would show up to class and not have a laptop. It would just be pen, pen and paper. And so as we were transitioning, you know, as a society within that, not a lot of people understood just how quickly that was going to move and just how much of a gap that was going to help create from the people that had access to that technology versus the people that did not. And so if you talk about this in 2024, you're like, of course, everybody needs an iPad, a laptop, you know, tech, you know, internet. 
that is not the way people were were thinking, you know, 15 years ago. Another one from Bryce uh, just came in. He asks, how do we continue awareness around DEI and social justice beyond just in Black History Month? Don't talk about it as a as a black issue. Like DEI is a everybody issue in all of the time issue. It is an issue for every underserved, every marginalized community. And it is an issue for every business that has not identified the fact that this is a big issue. And so the the way to, to keep the momentum going is to keep the foot on the gas and continue to talk about the benefits of having diverse employees, the benefits of having diverse you know, ideas and thought within different organizations, within different universities, within different teams. Those benefits aren't just present in February. In February, we talk about the past. We talk about you know, what you know, has, trans has transpired, how people have, have overcome. That's a moment of celebration and reflection. But the moment for DEI and the conversation for inclusion and making sure that people have a seat at the table should be talked about from January 1st to December 31st. Another question, what has been the toughest situation that you faced in sports and how did you overcome it? Um, I think the toughest situation for me was getting my foot in the door. Um, you know, I, I didn't have people from sports teams coming back to, to speak at school like, like this. And so I, everybody here, if you want to, you want to reach out, I'm happy to, to connect, but like, there wasn't opportunities. The way that I got my job as a sports agent is my best friend and I called every agent that we knew that graduated from our school. So we we went to to Duke at, we went to Duke and Notre Dame. He stayed at, at Duke for um for law school. So we had you know those two schools collectively, and we called every single agent that had anything to do with those schools, and nobody would take our calls. Nobody. And there's a lot of a lot of big name agents you know from there. So you can go, you can Google those lists, and they were so cold to us. And in my mind, I'm just like, yo, alumni should be helping young recent graduates who are just like asking questions. I wasn't asking for a job. I'm just like asking questions and people would not take the time to answer my questions. And so to me, getting my foot in the door and when people started answering my questions, I started getting traction. And then that traction led to job offers and now, you know, I'm on the other side of this screen, you know, talking to you, but it was the hardest thing was getting people to, to answer the questions. And so I would say, don't be shy, close mouths, don't, don't get fed, five no's in a row, don't matter if, if the sixth one is a yes. Somebody else asks, who is your greatest influence? Um my dad yeah um taught me um consistency is is key so wake up around the same time every every single day go to the gym it's like a very very regimented um way of thinking which helped me be regimented regimented as a litigator on on the lawyer side but helps me helps me process and so i would say that him instilling that structure and believing in me um, have been the the greatest influence that that I that I've had and and hopefully um, you know my oldest son who's over here eating fruit next to me now will will say something similar um, in in twenty years. A question from Ashley is: What skills do you feel like you need to have um, you know in bringing these conversations uh, you know in your your daily life? Empathy, thick skin, and the agreement that the person on the other side is not trying to offend you. Like those are those are the three things. If you can enter into a conversation with the understanding that you're not trying to offend the other person and the other person 
is not trying to offend you, then all of our disagreements, we can have those and they can be factually based dis disagreements that are less based in, in emotion. And if the emotion gets into that conversation, I know that you don't actually mean to offend me. You are just emotionally charged within this in this conversation. But if you are someone that that gets offended quickly or doesn't know how to to take that on on the chin, that's that that is a this is a difficult space to to be in. Are there any upcoming initiatives or projects uh, that that people on this call can look forward to at, at Barclays Center? Or you know anything with whether it's with the Nets, Liberty, Long Island Nets. Oh, we've we've got a we've got a lot we've got a lot going on. You know, as as we are, you know, in full tilt with the with the Long Island Nets, we have you know Caribbean night coming up uh, next week with um, with the Brooklyn Nets. We've got a uh, New York Liberty and Brooklyn Nets crossover that are that are taking place in in March. Um, and then, of course, we we look forward to kicking kicking it back off with you know the uh, Eastern Conference champion New York Liberty um, as they as they storm back to to start next season. Before we wrap it up, Jackie, this has been a great conversation. Um, any other advice you know for for student athletes um, looking to get into this space, looking to make a difference uh, in their communities? Um, you know, as they you know what you know what should they take away from from this conversation? Close mouths, don't get fed, keep your foot on the gas, keep going, and ask questions. Like there are so there are so many different things that are easier served when you just ask the right question. So take a step back and ask the right question. And particularly when you are attacking different issues or running into different roadblocks, you know, as you journey on this, this DEI space, the question is is always as to why this person has this stance and once you can get to that why that's the most helpful place to be well jackie this has been a great conversation um we appreciate it is there any you know any way that if anybody wants to reach out or ask any further questions uh they could do so um yes i don't even know my linkedin name but i can tell you my my email is j wilson at bseglobal.net all right great stuff well jackie we appreciate it uh thanks so much thanks everybody for for tuning in and for watching and uh, we will uh, we'll be watching, Jackie, everything that's happening at, at Barclays Center. Hey, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night.